So you got tasked with your first high stakes project. Are you excited? Maybe a little nervous? Or maybe really nervous because you're worried about the tight deadlines, the revenue, and your job? Well, fear not because we're gonna cover a number of ways to address and alleviate your anxieties in today's episode of Build. So stick around. Welcome to Build, brought to you by Pivotal Tracker. I'm your host, Pornima Vijay Shankar. In each episode, innovators and I debunk a number of myths and misconceptions related to building products, companies, and your career in tech. One misconception I had early on in my career when I was managing my first project was that I was the only one who was a nervous wreck. I worried about meeting deadlines, budget, and shipping it. I thought everyone else had their act together and it was just me. Well, it turns out it was all a facade and some people were just better at hiding it than I was. In today's episode, we're going to be addressing a number of anxieties that come up when you're managing your first high stakes project. And in future episodes, we'll talk about how to keep your team motivated to stay on course and successfully ship. And to help us out, I've invited Jen Leach, who is the VP of Engineering at Trust. Thanks for joining us today, Jen. Absolutely. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. So you and I met a few months back when we were both speaking, and I remember you talking about your first high-stakes project last year. But before we dive into that, let's start with your career. What got you interested in tech and eventually inspired you to start your own company? So I wouldn't say that I ever got into tech. I would say I started there. Uh Uh, I have always really, really loved math and science. Uh, I started coding when I was 10, and it was the natural place for me to be. I was just, that's where I was. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I found that in industry, I didn't always find the things that I wanted in my work environment. So uh, I started trust to create the work environment that I wanted to be in. And what kind of environment were you looking to create? So I wanted uh, an environment that would enable me to rise to the leadership positions that I felt that I, um, well, that I wanted to be in. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted it to be an environment that, was really empowering to all employees to um, rise to their greatest potential, to be to bring to bear the greatest contributions that they could to the business, rather than necessarily trying to cons- constrain or confine them to some limited pigeonhole mm-hmm. of, of what the, the business thinks is best for it, uh, which often limits the business potential itself. Mm-hmm. Nice. And so tell us what trust does. So Trust is a consultancy. Mm -hmm. We do uh, various software projects. Our capabilities range from uh, infrastructure and DevOps through to application development to architecture, and we also do some management consulting. Mm -hmm. Really what that is is a representation of um, the fact that our our staff have a really broad skill set. And we, uh, we rotate roles on any project that we are on, uh, up and down the stack and mm-hmm. across the stack. Oh, so cool. we, um, we feel as though that's one version of dog fooding yeah. that enables us to provide better service for anything we build. So maybe some of our viewers out there don't know what dog fooding is. What's that all about? Sure. Uh, so dog fooding is an industry term for if you are building a product, you had damn well better try it yourself. So uh, let's say that you put out a bowl of food for someone and you've never tasted it. It might actually be completely awful. (laughs) But if you make yourself eat it, then you have a sense of like, oh, I should make that better and make sure and the customer gets the benefit. So what do you do on a day to day basis as a VP of engineering? Yeah. So I as part of the, the dog fooding principle, I do the same work that our engineers do on a day to day basis insofar as I do client work. Um, about three to four days a week, I work on site with clients. Uh, then the, what I do with the rest of my time is really the VP of engineering kind of work. So I define processes that dictate how the engineering organization operates, mm-hmm. including things like um, our, our leveling process for how we help engineers move forward with their career, mm-hmm. how we do peer reviews. Uh, we implemented a salary transparency mm-hmm. Um, policy at our company and uh, 
the, all of, rolled that out in association with uh, doing market analysis and making sure that we had equal pay across mm -hmm. our organization. Mm -hmm. So do all of those things as well as institute um, client engagement processes for making sure that we set expectations properly, making sure that we learn from our experiences with clients, et cetera. Et cetera. Got it. Yeah. So last year you got tasked with managing your first high stakes project. Let's dive into that. I know you were initially pretty excited about it, right? Sure. Uh, I, I mean, I, I love a challenge. Yeah. So who was on your team with you? Right. So this is for a client project. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the project had been attempted a couple of times. It was for a uh, re-architecture of a big data processing pipeline. Mm -hmm. The pipeline that they had, uh, that uh, they were already using at the company, was an MVP version of the pipeline. And it had proved to be very difficult to change. It was very uh, monolithic. Okay. And it was slow to test any changes, slow to make any changes, very difficult to understand the code. Okay, so let's kind of break that down. So MVP is... Uh, minimum viable product. Okay, so like a prototype. That's correct. And then you mentioned that it was monolithic. What does that mean? Oh, monolithic, that means that uh, the code base that was used to process a pipeline was, uh, in this case, two very large code bases mm -hmm. that uh, had become very highly interconnected and so large in the number, number of lines of code and the amount of time that it took to test any changes that uh, it became very difficult to make any changes at all mm -hmm. for fear of breaking the system. Okay, so probably like a lot of interdependencies. Correct. So you fix one thing, something else breaks. Right, and you would have things like a, a part of the code base had, uh, m you know, several thousand line long Python um, scripts essentially mm -hmm. that, you know, you make one change in the middle and it wasn't really clear what would need to happen like, further down. Got it. And so what was the suggested course of action to fix that? Right, so uh, when we came in, and I didn't answer your early question, oh, go yet, ahead. so I should do yeah. that. So the team that they, they pulled together, uh, they asked me to lead the team, and the people on the team included the company CTO, mm -hmm. uh, a director of engineering, a senior engineer, a data scientist, and one other trust engineer. Mm -hmm. So a relatively small team, but a crack team. Yeah. And our early discussions were attended by the uh, COO and the VP of engineering. So you can tell this was something they cared about. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. So yeah, how did you kind of corral all of them and give them a sense of here's what our prescription is to fixing this monolithic code base? Right. Yeah. So the... Uh, I, I read a lot of research on collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, I, I care a lot about building the best product that you can with the team that you have. Mm -hmm. And the research that I've read talks a lot about uh, the, um, the dynamic in the team and how conversation occurs between people in the team and how that impacts the, the solutions that the team comes up with. Uh -huh. uh, one really interesting result from that research is that if you have a team of, let's say, five people, one person in the team has a really high IQ. They're a genius. <laughs> yeah. uh, that team does not do as well oh. as a team of five people who all have average IQs, but who all listen to each other really well. Okay. Interesting. Why is that? Good question. <laughs> um, the research did not necessarily try to explain why that was the result. Okay. However, what it did was they said repeatedly, if you take a team and you measure how well they take turns in conversation, how well they integrate, integrate in all the ideas from everyone who's participating, that those metrics will predict the quality of the solution much more strongly mm -hmm. than average IQ, as an example. Hmm. Now, I'm not a mind reader, but I assumed you were excited, but also maybe a little bit nervous because you said there were a lot of C-level executives there and a lot of senior folks on the team that had a vested stake in it. Mm -hmm. So how did you kind of get over that initial hurdle? Did you set any ground rules or framework? Right. So because we had a really tight timeline, mm -hmm. and I wanted to try to get the best I could from the team and we actually had to have a working prototype within four weeks, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, we're talking about working prototype, which was deployed and running real data. Mm -hmm. So, and on a big data processing pipeline. Um, Why such a tight timeline, by the way? 
That was because I, for two reasons. One, business needs. Okay. The um, company needed to uh, increase the number of clients they had per essentially deployed resource. Okay. Right? You know, so so there we have a cost. Okay. Um, a scale, cost scaling mm-hmm. issue here. And then also they uh, they had tried, since they had tried to do this project a couple of times already, Yeah, they had given themselves, let's say, maybe six months to do it, uh, but burned away five of those months. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the last. Got it. Okay. Effort. They came to you. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Okay. So yeah, how did you kind of take on this project? Or why, yeah. why did you take on this project? It's pretty tight. Well, you know, I didn't have a choice. I mean, insofar as... I showed up in a meeting room and they said, hey, Jen, you're leading this project. <laughs> okay. You know? um, which, to be honest, I, I don't mind. Okay. I, I think it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that's part of why I do what I do. But the it became clear that I needed to make sure that the team was going to be extremely productive mm-hmm. and simultaneously come up with a really good solution to the problem. Right. So uh, I came up with some some little tricks that I did in internally mm-hmm. to make sure that the team stayed on the right track and that I was facilitating the the collaboration process toward the most effective result. Now, did you share these tricks with the other people on the team or at least just for yourself? I did not, yeah. uh, actually. And, and it, I didn't even fully coalesce them yeah. into... Um, a collection of things until in you know hindsight twenty twenty right like I kind of looked back and said oh I did these things and, you know that was effective that worked you know yeah that kind of thing. and how were you consistent about enforcing them because that's another thing right like we make these rules these tricks for ourselves but sometimes we sort of hold ourselves accountable yeah so uh, I found that whenever I deployed them mm-hmm. the conversation was more effective okay. And so, in a way, it was really easy to enforce them because it, because everyone in the room felt the effect. Mm-hmm. And I found that uh, people would come up to me after the discussions and say, wow, that was such an effective discussion. Okay. Like, yeah. that was great. I don't know what you did, but, you know, okay. that kind yeah. of thing. So, it was self-reinforcing. Um, when when uh, stress levels increased or right. when people were tired, then sometimes I would forget. Yeah. And things would degrade a little bit, and then I'd say step back and be like, "Oh yeah, I should do that thing again." So right. it was it was um, easy to try to keep doing it because it was better. Okay. So yeah, let's tackle the first rule that you had for yourself. Yeah. So the f- first rule that I came up with was um, for me personally one of the one of the biggest changes in how I participated in these discussions. It was to say um, state facts. Not opinions. That's a great one. Can you give us an example of what that looks like in practice? Sure. Uh, so, really, this is about separating your ego from from what you're putting the ideas that you're putting forth, and it's a mechanic that that allows you to shed light on an idea without uh, becoming so attached to it that if it's a bad idea, you have difficulty letting it go. Okay. So as an example, uh, let's say that you want to su- suggest to a team that maybe a microservices architecture is the right solution for a problem that you have. Mm-hmm. So you could walk into the room and say, hey, a microservices architecture, that's going to solve problems A, B, C, and D for us. We should do it. I think it's totally going to work. What's, what's the next step? You're excited. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Being excited is great. However, um, you've immediately just jumped into that idea with your full heart and soul, in a way, mm-hmm. to, at the get-go. And if for some reason your idea isn't necessarily the best idea, then if someone comes and ta- comes back to you and says, "Ah, maybe that's not the best idea," then all of a sudden, <gasps> right, your hopes are dashed. Yeah, that's not so great. Yeah, um, you could take the same idea. Yeah, and you could walk into a room and you could say. I think that a microservice architecture could be interesting to look at. My understanding is that it should give us A, B, C, or D, or maybe all four. Does that sound right? Do you think that we would actually get those things from microservice architecture in this situation? And would there be any problems introduced 
by pursuing a microservices solution to this problem. Uh, and then in that situation, you are saying, here's some information. Mm -hmm. This is something we should examine. Let's examine it together. And then when someone comes into the room and says, well, you know, I think that maybe it won't do C for us. Because in this situation, that condition doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. And then you have a dialogue. And when you investigate that problem, you're no, it's no longer your idea or their idea. You're trying to find the truth. Yeah. So I know our audience out there is going to be really curious to know how do you go from that conversation to making a final decision so that yeah. you're not stuck consensus building. And we're going to cover that in the next episode. So, so stay tuned for that. But let's, let's move on. What's another rule that you gave for yourself as you were managing this project? Yeah, so um, another rule that I created was, uh, so that first rule was for kind of like you're bringing an idea to the table, mm -hmm. that perspective. The second one was the same, the same similar idea, but from a listener's perspective. Okay. Of saying, what well, was a mantra I used? Yeah. And it was, maybe they're right. I love this one because it does a lot of good for you in that you're not concocting stories. And a lot of the drama, I think, around a project also gets dispelled because you're giving people the benefit of the doubt. It's so hard to do in practice, <laughs> right? Let's, let's That's why it's a mantra. Yeah. 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 So let's talk about some examples that yeah. you, you had to use it in or that our viewers would have to use it. Yeah, right. Um, so in this microservices architecture yeah. kind of uh, example, um, so, you know, someone comes to you and says, hey, you know, I think that a microservices architecture might solve our problem. And let's say you as the listener mm -hmm. have built microservices, you've, you've transitioned from models that code bases to microservices 20 times, and you have a lot of context. You could say, hmm, nah, no, nah, I don't think so. Yeah. You, know, you, could just, you could just say, like, based on my experience, I think you're wrong. Uh, this tactic is about kind of putting that on its head and, and saying to yourself, maybe they're right, puts them in, puts yourself into their shoes. And once you're in their shoes and saying, well, maybe they're right, then you can say, okay, well, why do you think that a microservices architecture is the right solution to this problem? What, what specific problems does it solve for us? Mm -hmm. And then it, leads you in a path of, of thinking through their suggestion. And in as you do that, it may reveal things that maybe you didn't realize they were trying to solve. Mm. Maybe they have a different problem in mind to solve oh, yep. than what you do. And when you realize that they're trying to solve a different problem, you're like, maybe it does solve that problem in a way I hadn't thought about. Maybe if we use it in this one particular instance, mm -hmm. it will solve a different problem than I thought we had. That's so great, it, yeah. It, it helps you get over the assumptions of the problem you thought or gives you more context to see how deep of a problem it is. And it reveals mm -hmm. your assumptions. It right. reveals the other person's assumptions. And it, it, it opens you up to be a much better listener mm -hmm. um, and simultaneously also validates the other person's mm -hmm. ideas, uh, which may be one of the more important of that interaction, in fact. Yeah. I feel like both these mantras, rules, whatever you like to call them, are great for like 99% of the situations we have when we're managing that high stakes project. So thank you so much, Jen, for sharing them. Absolutely. Now, Jen and I would like to know, when was the last time you managed a high stakes project and what were some of the ground rules that you set either for yourself or for your team? Let us know in the comments below this video. That's it for today's episode of Build. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to receive the next episode where we'll tackle how to handle people who want to change the project mid-course. Ciao for now. This episode of Build is brought to you by our sponsor, Pivotal Tracker.